it's like in infinity. You can move towards it, further away from wherever you begin, but you'll never get there. It's unobtainable. But you can aim for it, like the sky. Indeed, the sky is even better. You can aim for it, never get there, and yet get right past it. What you thought was there is revealed not to be, and what happens is the sky opens up to something even deeper and more mysterious. Infinity is something you can approach, you can know about it, but you will just never get to it. There is a way to move towards it or away from it. You are always at the beginning of infinity and in all directions. Back to the horizon and the ocean. The ocean is vast, but it's a poor metaphor. Even the sky is a poor metaphor. But I'm here because, well, this place is both a metaphor and the actual real thing. This place has the ominous name in Sydney, Australia of The Gap. The history of The Gap is not particularly optimistic. It's infamous for reasons the viewer may guess or can research themselves. I'm interested in this place because it is right in the middle between, over there, civilization. And over there, nothingness. In a sense, this is a beginning of infinity. We can see where we've started. And out there, hostility. Civilization making its first inroads into infinity. Yet, here we are, always in the gap between pushing into the frontiers, not just physically of course, but in a sense the precondition for that, pushing into the abstract space of knowledge creation, of explaining the rest and so coming to control it all. Let's begin. Hello, I'm um, going to try a little experiment today. I'm going to start uh, reading through parts of the beginning of infinity, just the first chapter. I've seen at least one other Aussie doing this with a different series of books. Um, I don't know if it'll be useful. Um, I thought I'd try it just as an experiment, um, sort of thinking out loud, I guess, um, and just commenting on some of my favorite parts of the book. Um, by doing so, it kind of clarifies my own thoughts about things. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing also, there is, the is a sense in the critical rationalist community that there's a lot of bad ideas out there, or false ideas, that get a lot of traction in an undeserved kind of way, while the ideas of Popper and Deutsch, for example, don't. And so this might go some way to addressing that. Well, there we are. That's where I began. I wasn't sure where I was going with all this, but I sort of knew the point back then. As I said, it was basically to help me understand the book a little bit better by thinking out loud and clarifying my own ideas about things. And the other thing was to speak about the bad ideas that are out there by way of critique. Competing ideas really are critiques of one another. But in many cases, one idea really is a valid critique of another idea and refutes the other idea. The world is flooded in pessimism right now. It is drowning in misconceptions about how knowledge is created. It's saturated by a desire, apparently, for stagnation. 
a kind of precautionary principle when it comes to progress. We, by which I mean Western civilization, saying nothing about cultures that are more primitive still, are trapped by really bad ideas, irrational memes and anti-rational memes. And this book, The Beginning of Infinity, is the best antidote I know of. Sure, there are other works out there about progress and optimism, books that focus on one aspect or another of this grand vision, but none of them, like The Beginning of Infinity, actually unite all the crucial aspects of this one worldview into one synthesized whole, because it's only in uniting these ideas that you really come to appreciate the cosmic significance of people, or at least the potential cosmic significance of us in particular. But few take that seriously. It's sadly almost a joke to some people. I was frustrated recently listening to Sam Harris and Ricky Gervais speaking. They've got a podcast out uh, this year, 2021, um, called Absolutely Mental. And it's entertaining in parts. It's it's funny. Of course, Ricky is a, a great comedian. But In terms of philosophy, and he is uh, trained in philosophy, as Sam is, he is a standard vanilla-style pessimist and anti-human. He wouldn't think that. He would think that he's a great humanist. But in fact, he denigrates people as being the cause of just so many problems in, in the style of David Attenborough, in the style of so many public intellectuals, that we are the poison and there needs to be some cure to prevent our spreading across the globe, much less the rest of the cosmos. Now, happily, during this podcast with Sam Harris, Sam did go some way to explaining some parts of David Deutsch's worldview and invoked the name of David Deutsch. And one would hope that Ricky would go and research some of these ideas, perhaps read The Beginning of Infinity, but I doubt it because Ricky dismissed what Sam said, uh, treated this this grand vision of knowledge and people and their cosmic significance as merely of academic abstract interests. He, he brushed it aside because it seemed to him, I guess in his own mind, as it does to many people, like science fiction rather than actual science. It seems too good to be true, or even worse than that, too bad to be true, that in some moods, of course, people such as Ricky Gervais, such as your standard public intellectual, think that people gaining control of the planet, the solar system, the cosmos, is something like a nightmare. Because these people have already been convinced, are convinced, that we've ruined the planet, that we are like some kind of virus, and that The only cure to this is to somehow eradicate us from the face of the earth. If not that, then to severely diminish our power to survive on this planet. Of course, that's not the way they would see it, but they do. And a large part of Ricky and Sam's podcast was about how we are just on the continuum of all other animals that live on this planet. That we are nothing special. And that even Ricky Gervais explicitly said... We're just like an ape using a tool, but just a little bit better. We're just the next step along that smooth continuum. And Sam did try to mention that this was misconceived, but still, I'm not sure that Sam quite understands what this position of ours actually is. And I suppose to some extent, why should he? Why should anyone? The culture is absolutely saturated, as I said, from a decades-long campaign against people, against our significance. And the reason for that comes from things like environmentalism, yes, that we are the cause of the ills of the world, but also it's a reaction against superstitious religion, which in many ways it's been right for people to criticise and to reject the bad parts of religion. But in doing so, they've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. There was a lot of baby in that bathwater. I know that Sam thinks there's not, but there really is. And importantly, a very important and crucial part of many of the big religions of the world is placing people at the centre of the cosmos, in a sense. Certainly at the centre morally. 
And, and Sam might say, you know, the moral landscape is a book that he wrote about the significance of consciousness for morality. But the problem is he doesn't put people there at the centre of morality. The concerns of people rather than all conscious creatures. As if all conscious creatures have a claim to moral status to the extent that they're conscious. And I think this is wrong. And I think this is wrong because the kind of consciousness we have, at least one aspect of the consciousness that we have, an aspect of consciousness, this mystery of whatever, whatever, whatever it means to be a person, one aspect of this mystery is our capacity to create explanations. And for reasons beyond the scope of this episode, because I've talked about it so much, I think that is the crucial feature of our existence. That means we are categorically different in moral terms compared to any other conscious creature. And so even Sam, who tries to salvage something from the religious morality, which is that people are important and they're not just another physical system, but they actually have consciousness or creativity, the capacity to understand the universe in which they find themselves, Sam lumps them in, just as Ricky does, just as every public intellectual almost today does, alongside all other animals. And that we're nothing ultimately special in the cosmic scheme of things. The beginning of infinity is a different worldview. It is a reaction against this kind of thinking. So I think it is sad. Something has been lost with the rejection of religion by public intellectuals. Because there are many important things to salvage there. And I'll come to some of those later. But importantly, the, for want of a better word, sacredness of humanity. The sacredness of the individual human life. And this is not about religious thinking. It's not about starting a different kind of religion. Because there's nothing here that one needs to believe. Honestly, there's nothing here that you need to believe as actually, finally, once and for all true. There are no dogmas or doctrines. What there are, are fallible explanations. And that itself is not a belief either. Any of this can be overturned, criticized, reinterpreted by you in a way that suits you, that works for you, that solves your problem, allows you to move forward and make progress, and hopefully everyone else to make progress as well. To come to a consensus in order to resolve conflicts, but not to adhere to the text in some way, as religious people would. And as people who are against religion do exactly the same thing, adhere to the text and say, well, that's wrong because of precisely the way it's been written. Or we must believe it because of the precisely the way it's been written. And this is a shame, even within religious communities, which we have to admit, the overwhelming majority of people are still religious to a greater or lesser extent. And even many people in the West who ostensibly call themselves religious are losing, losing their faith in the sacredness of the specialness of human life. That they regard not only other creatures on the planet as of equal moral status, but of the inert planet itself as of equal moral status. That we need to sacrifice ourselves to the planet. This is not something that comes out of traditional religion. But they'll try and tell you it does now. We have things in Christianity. I know, because my background is Christi Christian. I've, I've worked in Christian institutions, Catholic institutions. They have things like eco-theology now. Eco-theology. The way in which we need to basically worship Mother Earth. This is, to some extent, mainstream Catholic teaching. So th they're off the rails to a large extent. But traditional religion is losing its way insofar as it had a good way at all to begin with. The, the, the things that were redeemable about it are being lost, diluted by even worse ideas. <laughs> there is a rank order of bad ideas. Some are worse than others. And traditional religious ideas, bad as they are, are possibly superior to the new religion, to the new religions of politics, environmentalism, anti-humanism. At least traditional religions regarded people as being 
of prime importance, of central importance, and that that's what civilization was about, trying to protect people and trying to enable people to get along so that they can continue to solve their problems off into the infinite future and that things would get better as well, that things would get better. Now, we don't think people are spiritually divine. We don't endorse souls and mysticism. But the alternative is not to think that people are not special because we are, just not in a mystical, supernatural way. We're special. We're not on a continuum with other animals. This is the point I keep returning to. And it's a point I keep returning to because I think people need to hear it. Because of all the messages in the beginning of infinity, the one that I think can do the most work in pushing back against the current moral zeitgeist is pessimism about people. If you recognize that people are different and special, not in precisely the same way that traditional religions have said, but special nevertheless, then you will do what it takes in order to construct your worldview, construct your knowledge, construct your approach to life, in order to not only allow people to continue to survive, but to flourish, to flourish and make progress faster than ever, to create wealth more than we've had before, to aim for these things as a kind of good in and of itself. So all of this has been motivation for this podcast as I enter this this final episode. The book has certainly shaped my mind. Books can do this. And I know it's a lot of other people have experienced the same shift in worldview or a similar shift in worldview. Discussing books, talking about books, can do this even more deeply. As I've said before, with me, the first time this really properly happened was with the fabric of reality. Because I learned that the world could make sense. Someone put into words the idea that everything could eventually make sense. And that academics, intellectuals, public figures who relished in trying to confuse with jargon or to try and impress one with their superior knowledge and who would tell you that there's no point thinking about certain things because that's just a mystery we'll never solve. Here's David Deutsch in The Fabric of Reality telling you that this is false, that in fact the world can make sense and it's more beautiful in the fact that it can make sense. People like Carl Sagan had made these noises. Richard Feynman had made these noises, of course, as well. That the vision that you get of reality, once you understand it can be comprehensible, is so much better than simply falling back into the wonder and mystery of it all without being concerned about what the answers are. You should have both. Awe and wonder at the majesty of reality and the fact we can understand it. We people can understand it. We are part of that grand vision because we uniquely, as far as we know, in the universe, can understand parts of that reality and eventually everything that can be understood. So the fabric of reality taught me this. In particular, the first thing it taught me was that quantum theory was perfectly comprehensible. Not in all parts. There are mysteries there. There are open questions. But the parts we do understand can be understood. We don't have to fall back onto nonsense. We don't have to jump to supernatural explanations. In any area, by the way, anytime there's an open question, we do not jump to a supernatural explanation. That's not required. Now, after the fabric of reality, it was a, a long time until I was so impressed by a book again. Not quite equal to the fabric of reality, but it, it took a while. And I was reading widely. And I kind of thought I understood the worldview in The Fabric of Reality, but as it turned out, I didn't really. And there's, in a sense, an objective measure of this for me in my own mind. Because as I say in my other series that I've just commenced doing on The Fabric of Reality, although I'd read that book multiple times, and I'd even discussed it online, and I'd even discussed it online to a limited extent with David Deutsch himself, I don't think I truly got it in all respects. I mean, most importantly, I did indeed understand, I thought, the science, but I didn't really take on board the Popperian epistemology. At least, 
I might have understood it academically at one level, but I wasn't living it. I wasn't taking it on board as being part of genuinely my worldview because I didn't really notice when people were anti-Popperian, when intellectuals, philosophers, people out there in the world were saying things that were just antithetical to the work of Karl Popper and to David Deutsch. I, I, I noticed the errors some of the time, but not all of the time. So one of, one of the first books that kind of did impress me after The Fabric of Reality was in 2004, Sam Harris published his first book, The End of Faith. And that was the beginning of a whole series of books published on the same theme that were anti-religious. There was books by Richard Dawkins, by Christopher Hitchens, by Daniel Dennett. And I read all of these. I bought all of these. I just ate them up voraciously. In the case of Sam, I, I loved his style of writing. It was lyrical. It was metaphorical. It was poetic. I just liked that style of prose, the clarity of it. And I already was on board with so much of what he said in terms of the anti-superstitious stuff, the anti-faith stuff. It certainly was the most withering and clear attack against standard organized religion and faith that I'd ever read until that point. And, and listening to Sam speak in those, in those early years of his fame was refreshing because there are few people out there that I was aware of in the media who could speak with such clarity and just cut through the nonsense. But I mention this because although I was reading all of these guys, Harris, Dawkins, Hitchens, Dennett, you know, and, and, and others as well, what I didn't notice was all of the errors throughout these works. It seemed to me that if a sentence was written clearly and made sense, that was enough. And it didn't jump out at me that so much of this writing, so much of this work that people had done, the anti-religious stuff, which touched on the intersection or rather the clash between the religious and the scientific worldviews, that I didn't notice the poverty of epistemology and an understanding of science there and the, the philosophy of science and the philosophy of mathematics and just the general way in which we view people now. And the, 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 that's there in the fabric of reality to a large extent. I didn't notice. I didn't notice because although I'd read the fabric of reality multiple times and I was having online discussions about it and I understood it at a level, it hadn't really formed part of the memeplex, so to speak, that was in my mind. My literal way of seeing everything, analysing everything, in particular people's writing and people's speech. So I, I, I was quite readily persuaded, to a large extent, by clarity of writing. Clarity of writing that criticised nonsense like superstition. And I thought, well, if they're criticizing superstition, well, then they're correct in the way that they do it. And I was wrong about that. It's right to criticize superstition and religion, but there are ways of doing it that are better and worse. The End of Faith was published in 2004, and that's interesting because it's exactly midway between the publication date of The Fabric of Reality and The Beginning of Infinity. And the reason I mention that is because of this psychological phenomena of learning that I want to speak about. And that is, as I say, my worldview changed when I read The Fabric of Reality. I thought I understood science far more deeply. And academically, I thought I understood the epistemology to some extent. If you, if you, for example, if you pressed me to make a study of a particular passage of text and to say, what was wrong with it in light of Popper's philosophy? I probably could have done it with some effort, with some effort, but it wouldn't have been second nature to me. It was only after the beginning of infinity, possibly for the first time, I don't want to talk myself up, maybe it took a second read and, and, and some discussions, but whatever. Soon after reading the beginning of infinity, things became what I can only describe as effortless. I was, without effort, 
able to read a text and almost immediately the errors in epistemology, the errors in thinking, the pessimism, the prophecy, the poverty of content was immediately revealed to me. What was, what was there in my mind in an academic sense after reading The Fabric of Reality became my lived experience, as people say, after reading The Beginning of Infinity. I didn't simply remember the facts that were in The Fabric of Reality. I understood. And in particular, I understood what epistemology was. And that became so obvious to me psychologically. Because prior to the beginning of infinity, if I had heard a person everyone else said was smart, saying something smart, erudite, insightful, I'd typically nod along and in some sense be transfixed by the clarity of their language. And I'd think to myself, well, they're making sense. That's enough. But after the beginning of infinity, so much more often, I began thinking when people were speaking publicly, writing beautifully clear articles, I would think to myself, well, that makes sense, but making sense is not enough. They're making errors. They're making serious errors, errors that kind of like dominoes cause their entire argument to collapse. You can make perfect sense and be completely wrong. And you can make perfect sense and reach the correct conclusions by an invalid argument because you began in the wrong place. The premises were wrong. The premises were wrong, but you followed the rules of inference and you reached a conclusion, which is the correct conclusion by an invalid method, <laughs> because <you're laughs> which is the correct conclusion, which can happen by chance. It happens by chance. Or if not by chance, it's because people know what the correct conclusion is, but have worked backwards using a false epistemology by which they can prove just about anything, including the true conclusion by a bad method. So I, I began to think that I understood why smart people thought what they thought, and then I understood why they were wrong. So if I take, again, it's a book that I recommend to people, and I think it's written beautifully, but, and, and, and as you know, one of my maxims in life is one of the greatest things you can do for any work and any idea is to criticize it. So let's take The End of Faith, Sam Harris's first book. I understood why the central thesis made sense and why you would reach those conclusions and why those conclusions were in fact correct some of the time. But the argument was wrong. For example, why be an atheist? Now, Sam doesn't use the word atheism or atheist, I think, throughout the book, and he's made this point quite a few times. But on this worldview of Harris, Dawkins, Hitchens, Dennett, and on almost everyone's worldview, the standard intellectual take is that you're an atheist because there's no evidence for God. There's no evidence for God. So one should not believe in God. And at the time when I heard these things over and again, I thought it was completely a reasonable position to hold. That is why one is forced into atheism, why one doesn't believe theism. But it's wrong. There's no evidence for anything. And the fact is that I know, forget belief, I know there is no God. Now, why? Well, because no explanation requires me to invoke the existence of God. I mean, the same place as Laplace talking to Napoleon Bonaparte, who, when Laplace explained, I think it was projectile motion to Napoleon, Napoleon said, these equations are lovely, but where is God? And uh, Laplace apparently said, well, sire, I have no need of that hypothesis. And this has been true ever since I've kind of come to the realization one does not need to invoke that God hypothesis to explain anything. Okay, there are open questions, certainly, but we do not need to leap to God as the explanation. So when I, and again, when I say I know that God does not exist, it does not mean I am certain God does not exist. And you can see my blog post for this. But I raise this because this is, again, another thing that uh, Ricky Gervais seems to insist on, that we must be agnostic on almost all questions. Because in his mind, and I think this is just common knowledge out there among intellectuals of a certain stripe, um, 
that no means be certain of. That you can't actually say, I know that, unless you are 100% sure, which is a standard no one can reach. And so Ricky rejects saying that he knows that God does not exist. Instead, he, instead he just says, I, he doesn't believe it. Of course, in my Papirian worldview, I don't have beliefs either. I just have knowledge, and I act on the knowledge or I don't act on the knowledge. But also, now, The End of Faith, again, I recommend the book. It's a nice book. It's a withering attack on religion. But now, uh, after the beginning of infinity, I'm not personally, particularly anti-religious. The anti-religious arguments now strike me as like level big brain. You know, these memes, this big brain, galaxy brain thing. Well, the anti-religious stuff is like big brain. Rather than being caught in religion, you then just reject it all. But I think the galaxy brain take is more like, although superstitions and parts about angels and gods and miracles are false, there's a heck of a lot to preserve with religion. And there's reasons for this. In much the same way, there's a heck of a lot to preserve in civilization broadly. And that, that thing that's worth preserving is a certain kind of tradition. And although I hesitate to use the word, a certain kind of collectivism, which is not a collectivism of a political kind or a coercive kind, but it might be something where I would distance myself from Ayn Rand-type objectivism, where I think that is highly, highly anti-religious and to some extent highly anti-tradition as well. But I'm, I'm against force and the extraction of wealth and coercion and all that kind of stuff. What I, what I am talking about here in endorsing tradition, endorsing religion, the galaxy brain view of these things, which is a real step beyond traditional sceptical philosophy and even certain time, types of modern sceptical philosophy, is I am talking about the value of having traditions and cultures of organizing societies and communities which themselves contain inexplicit knowledge about how to keep dynamic societies from falling into staticity. Let me just say that sentence again. I'm talking about the value of having traditions and cultures of organizing societies and communities which contain inexplicit knowledge about how to keep dynamic societies from falling into staticity. It's a rather verbose sentence in some ways, and I think it's um, constructed particularly well. But I, I, just, I just say it and, and put it on the screen there to illustrate something. I think that, that if you understand English, you can read that sentence and you can say, okay, it makes sense. But if you are knowledgeable about the beginning of infinity world, you're deeply knowledgeable, you will understand that sentence at a very different level to what anyone, no matter how clever they are, how erudite they seem, how well qualified they are, you'll understand it in a way that is very different to everyone else. Because notice how dense it is, how dense with knowledge that sentence is, how much background one needs in the entire worldview of the beginning of infinity to get it. I mean, really Get it. Not just superficially be able to read the words and guess one understands what is intended. Notice if I wanted to explain that sentence in the beginning of infinity terms, how I would have to explain whole aspects of the worldview for hours on end just to explain a single sentence for someone who'd never read the book before. Inexplicit knowledge. What is that? Well, I'd have to begin with a Papirian view of what knowledge was in the first place. So there's a whole hour of conversation. Then the inexplicit part, not merely implicit, inexplicit. Then moving on to dynamic societies, that would require an explanation about, well, explanations and progress and memes. Memes, goodness, that there's another whole episode if I was going to unpack this. And memes would take us into cultures. Cultures takes us into static societies and anti-rational memes. And then how, how certain traditions, specifically traditions of criticism, allow for open-ended progress. Look, already in explaining what I would need to explain 
to explain that sentence, I've gone on for ages. And this is what I mean about the beginning of infinity once you take it on board. Some people have said recently, I've observed, that Naval has remarked more than once that the beginning of infinity is not an easy book to read. And others have said that that observation is a disservice to the book. But Naval's absolutely right. It's not easy. But that shouldn't put anyone off. That's not a criticism. And that shouldn't frighten anyone away. That's what it means for a book to have value. If it was easy, everyone would already understand what's in there anyway, and there'd be no point reading it. Interesting books are sometimes hard to read. The Lord of the Rings is hard to read, but I love it. I, I read it every couple of years because it's just a great, entertaining book. And there's a sense in which the beginning of infinity can be read because it's entertaining over and again. But it's far, far deeper than something like Lord of the Rings. There are many more levels, of course, but it's not easy. A, a single sentence like the one that I just tried to unpack or began to unpack, to explain, to unpack how I would unpack it, illustrates why this podcast series is, has been important to me. Because as I said in that very first episode, I'm trying to clarify in my own mind what this is all about. Fun things are not necessarily easy. It's what makes them fun is the challenge. And in, in reading The Beginning of Infinity for the first time, or maybe the second time, to use a biblical passage, the scales fell from my eyes and I saw properly, properly saw what was there in the fabric of reality the whole time and what's there in Popper's work to a large extent the whole time. And it was then, it was then that my, my actual perceptions of the world, my, the, the qualia, my subjective experience of the world did indeed change because where before I could appreciate excellent writing just for its own sake, now so much of it seemed much more worse than before. And I'm not here referring mainly to the work of Sam Harris. It, it's br much, much much broader than this. I mean, almost every other book on my shelf, every other non-fiction book on my shelf, when I flicked through it, became a confusing trial of the mind. I would just spot error after error, and it happens to this day. It's not to say that I can't learn from certain books or that books have ruined it all for me. Uh, for example, more than once I've recommended uh, A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos by uh, the astronomers uh, Barnes and Lewis. It's a good book. I can learn from it and I recommend it to people. It's written very well. It's, it's funny in places. But it's just to say that now I notice glaring errors in epistemology all the time. And when the claims about science, the, 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 the ostensive topic of the book, the, the main subject matter of the book, I can recognize when those claims are dubious, no matter how certain the authors claim to be. In short, I no longer feel, no matter how qualified an expert happens to be, I don't think they're necessarily better than me, even in those areas where they claim expertise. I've ceased to be intimidated by expertise. And that's a very good thing. I'm very anti-authority now. And this is the sense in which it's self-help. I'm error-correcting constantly now, double-thinking what the expert opinion is, no matter how confident they seem to be, because I'm comfortable asking rather than trusting. I think it's a great virtue to ask and ask and ask until you understand, rather than just assuming that by virtue of the fact someone is qualified in a particular area, that they will know better than you. They may, but you better have a good explanation as to why they should know better than you on that particular claim they're making. When, when I was at uni studying philosophy and physics, at the undergraduate level especially, I was somewhat in awe of the professors, or even just the PhD students. I thought they must have been so deeply knowledgeable and clever. I almost thought their minds must operate in a different way. And when it came to famous public intellectuals, forget it. I thought they must have been on a different plane altogether. But I was wrong to think all that. They're all just people. I never understood, for example, why the philosophy professors who taught me back then and who mentioned Popper during lectures and tutorials once or twice didn't big him up more. Why they didn't make a bigger deal about him. Because I knew that David Deutsch was in The Fabric of Reality, for example. But now I know. I didn't know then, but I know now. And I can say without... Any concern, they didn't understand him. Experts in Popper at university 
aren't actually experts by and large. I know what this is like now. I read Popper soon after I read The Fabric of Reality. And it's the knowledge was there. I could regurgitate it. Not entirely, because I hadn't really taken it on board. And if I had gotten into a debate with someone about the content of Karl Popper's work, I guess I would have come up short. Because you need a proper guide. And the beginning of infinity was my proper guide. Now, I, don't, I can't fully explain why I didn't get it there in the fabric of reality. I, it's probably to do with the fact you sometimes need the lesson more than once. And you need to talk about these things and really think them through. But the fact is that the beginning of infinity did indeed reveal Karl Popper's epistemology to me. It took David Deutsch to do that. And then I could go back and properly appreciate Popper in a new light, far more deeply, and then realize those others who tried explaining his worldview typically got it all wrong, totally wrong. They treated Popper just like another purely academic philosopher, just another set of readings alongside Kant and Descartes and so on, but it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking. Now, this is not to say, I should add, that I don't recommend studying philosophy at uni. I, I can recommend it if you want, but I don't think that their advertising material in this day and age is at all true when I go looking at university courses on philosophy. They say that it will help you think better. I think it'll help you if you're not prepared, if you're not prepared with a certain amount of intellectual self-defense, it may cause you to think worse, far worse. Philosophy at uni is like history and literature more than anything else. You read the texts, you study the texts, you argue about the texts. You won't really improve your thinking. You won't become, by any stretch of the imagination, a critical thinker. At least at the universities that I've looked at. Maybe there are some unicorn universities out there who do a really good job at this. Mainly if you're not prepared, you'll become indoctrinated into inductivism, justificationism, and so on and so forth. All of the bad ideas of today. I now recognize, for example, that my own father, who never went to university, none of my family did. And my extended family, my grandparents, uh, to this day, I'm the only one for generations to have gone to university. And it's not a source of pride to me that I went to university, but it is a source of pride to me that the rest of my family didn't because their method of thinking was so much superior and remains so much superior to many mainstream academics that, that I've encountered throughout my life. My father especially is better than, a better thinker than the philosophy professors who taught me. My father was a, an aircraft engineer and he understood what it took for things to work and how to identify garbage when it was being presented to him. But academic philosophers so often can't do this. They don't understand the practical consequences of certain kinds of reasoning. But again, that too took reading The Beginning of Infinity to figure out. Common sense realism is, after all, what Popper refined and made explicit. Most people are common sense realism. The galaxy brain is common sense realism. It's only the, the big brain take that is anti this and anti that with their Bayesianism and their evidence for and their justified beliefs. That's all confusing, abstract style thinking disconnected from the actual practice of solving problems. Now, the only, the only difference really between, I should say, between man on the street style thinking and Popperian style epistemology is that Popperian style epistemology has the vocabulary to explain how thinking works and how progress is made and how problems are solved. That's all it does. It makes explicit these things that already work out there in the world. And people don't need to understand how it works, broadly speaking. I've compared this before to the difference between an airline pilot and an aircraft engineer. The aircraft engineer better know how the engines work. The pilot doesn't really need to. Maybe they have some basic ideas, but they're going to have a whole bunch of misconceptions as well. All they need to do is to fly the aircraft from point A to point B without ever really worrying about the details about what's going on with the computer systems, with the avionics, with the, the engines, and so on and so forth. They have a limited understanding of those things. This is the difference between someone who really understands Popperian epistemology, that's like the engineer, and the person who just gets on with making progress. That's the pilot. There are other people out there, call them, call them Bayesian engineers, who all they do, they never actually work on 
engines at all. They never actually are able to figure out how the whole machine keeps on going. They're over there at the side with something that they call an engine, but in fact, it's just a pile of sticks. And they're explaining how this pile of sticks, if only you could put them together into a particular way, would indeed be an engine. But they never go about actually creating an engine. Whereas what a Popperian does is actually explain the already existing engine and how it works and why it functions. And if something starts to go wrong, they can identify why the progress stops, why there is a problem in science. Here's the error. Let's correct the error. That's what a Popperian epistemologist does. They're more like the engineer, an actual engineer working on real engines rather than imaginary ones, which is what various other kinds of epistemology do. They're abstractly being concerned about possible engines. <laughs> okay, that is a very tortured analogy. I apologize for that. Whatever the case, Popper and Deutsch make explicit the ways in which people really do think, really do learn, really do create knowledge. How it all works. How civilization is built. As Naval tweeted recently, civilization is not built by pessimists. And in my last episode, I remarked about the unholy trinity of pessimism and prophecy and how it's all fed by this false epistemology. So if you want to study philosophy, especially at philosophy at university or anything at all, I think you do need intellectual self-defense against the dark arts of the intelligentsia that rules there now. I think a lot of people have little crumbs of the story. I mean, there are people who rightly oppose Marxism in universities and postmodern type thinking and all the doublespeak that goes on there now. But again, if you want the full suite of armor and the shield and the laser sword, then you want the beginning of infinity. And, and if, of course, if you, if you read um, the fabric of reality as well and the work of Popper and, well, other things recommended at the beginning of infinity, then you'll be like a fully kitted out intellectual Jedi master of a kind. And you'll be able to sit in on philosophy seminars, debates, discussions, and learn without fear of ever being indoctrinated and be able to quickly identify errors in thinking. Now, that has been one of the longest preambles to any of my episodes, but it's only fitting as this is the last episode on the beginning of infinity. And as well, I don't have much left to read. And in this section that I am going to read, this, this final section, there is a vast list of deep questions, which of course illustrate the beginning of infinity. They're profound mysteries. And to a large extent, they're going to leave your head spinning. And I want to unpack some of them. I'll have no answers, but I do want to discuss some of them. So let's go back to the book. And David writes, The economist Robin Hansen has suggested that there have been several singularities in the history of our species, such as the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution. Arguably, even the early Enlightenment was a singularity by that definition. Who could have predicted that someone who lived through the English Civil War, a bloody struggle of religious fanatics versus an absolute monarch, and through the victory of the religious fanatics in 1651, might also live through the peaceful birth of a society that saw liberation and reason as its principal characteristics? The Royal Society, for instance, was founded in 1660, a development that would hardly have been conceivable a generation earlier. Roy Porter marks 1688 as the beginning of the English Enlightenment. That is the date of the Glorious Revolution, the beginning of predominantly constitutional government, along with many other rational reforms which were part of that deeper and astonishingly rapid shift in the prevailing worldview. Pausing there, just my reflection on this. Roy Porter is a historian that I learned about from David Deutsch, um, from uh, this book. And I think David tweeted once that it was Roy Porter who explained that there were two distinct kinds of enlightenment, one of which was the English Enlightenment. And so I went and investigated this more, and it really inspired me to read the work of Roy Porter and to listen to some of his lectures. And in one of those lectures, indeed, about uh, one of his books, there's a video of him, and this is on YouTube, by the way. His thesis is that there were two things called the Enlightenment of a very distinct kind, and indeed, they were opposite in many ways. They were, they were absolutely opposed to one another. There was the English Enlightenment, 
And by English, by the way, he he means British because certainly Scotsmen like Adam Smith and David Hume were involved, but it, but it was called the English Enlightenment. He's called it the English Enlightenment because. The other thing that was altogether separate was the European Enlightenment, the Enlightenment that was going on the continent of Europe, France and Germany in particular. And here we really get into the philosophy wars, and I don't use that word lightly, because it really did, the ideas there, set the scene for war later on. I mean, there are a lot of reasons and a lot of ways in which we could explain the missteps in Europe especially over the recent decades, relatively recent decades. And one of the impulses are, of course, primary among them are the ideas that people have. Ideas are levers that push people's behaviours. And importantly, philosophical ideas motivate political ones, which motivate politicians, which then cause militaries to do what they do. So this is not mere abstract arguing. It's not merely of abstract interests. This has absolutely real-world consequences. And there is a reason why the English tradition, the British tradition of governance, and and just tradition more broadly, resists tyranny and violence. And this is controversial to say, but I'll just say it. There is a reason why the French Revolution happened in France, why the violence there was so great. And why Germany has had the political problems that it has had. And why Spain has, well through to today. It is no accident the EU exists in Europe. And many people, of course, think that an organisation like the EU exists to benefit the region and the world. They say it exists in part to keep the peace. But why does the peace need to be kept on the continent of Europe in the first place? Why is Europe a special problem? Is there an underlying reason for the conflict that seems to degenerate into violence there? Violence which we should be eager to keep in mind, Britain has stood against numerous times. These are not accidents. But in these matters, I must say I'm a complete amateur and I recommend the work of Roy Porter on this and also Daniel Hannan, uh, his, his book Inventing Freedom. But, but my take, my takeaway from Roy Porter, among others, on this, is that it's, it really is people like Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, versus people like Adam Smith, the philosopher credited with the beginnings of capitalism. Locke on freedom, Hume on reason. These guys, Smith, Locke, Hume, against Kant. And yet they're all studied in philosophy departments around the world and at universities as if, well, they're all just different aspects of the same kind of enlightenment. And they're not. They're absolutely not. Kant is standing against those guys. He's standing against capitalism and freedom and reason, Smith and Locke and Hume. What was Kant about? Well, among many things, and I don't want to get into a long exploration of the ideas, the poverty of ideas of Immanuel Kant. But he had a critique of reason. He said he had a critique of pure reason. I'm not going to defend Kant. I will just say he was about how people cannot trust themselves or their own minds and as a consequence require strong leadership. He argues against individuals and to some extent, like Plato, for tyrants or for tyranny something like Plato's Philosopher Kings. He thinks that we should should subjugate ourselves. Kant thinks this. We're morally obliged, for example, to obey every law of a government. He exalts government to the place of a god. And this is the European tradition of their view between the individual and the government. And it infects now aspects of American politics, Australian politics, Western politics broadly. There is this battle. There is this battle between the British Enlightenment tradition of freedom in the individual and of pursuing wealth and the more European style of tyranny, authoritarianism and subjugating the individual before the state. The English tradition, to be fair, does not devalue government. It has a place for government. It just doesn't offer it up as a substitute either for God or the individual mind. 
the whole point of the tradition of the British political culture is that government is there to preserve the rights of the individual. Now, of course, that ideal is one that all political parties over time through the British tradition in whatever country, they fail to live up to this ideal. Again and again, they fail to live up to it. But at least it's there as an ideal, as an aspiration. The ideology underlying the alternative democratic systems is to subjugate oneself to the authority of the government. It's a stark difference. And so this is a very interesting area of the history of philosophy and of philosophy. But I think more work can be done on following the work of Roy Porter that even today our ideological conflicts can be traced back to the antecedents centuries ago where people were debating the relationship between the individual and the state, the role of reason in the world. And could people, individuals, come to create knowledge such that they could be, to use modern parlance, error correctors of their own lives rather than relying upon some authority to do it for them, to sit back inert and passive and hope that the man on the television screen wearing the tie with the title will tell you what to do next rather than you reasoning it through yourself. It's the British tradition versus the European tradition. That seems very parochial, but of course these things have universal application into every other continent of the world and every other people and civilization of the world as well. There's a choice to be made. Back to the book. David writes, Also, the time beyond which scientific prediction has no access is different for different phenomena. For each phenomena, it is the moment at which the creation of new knowledge may begin to make a significant difference to what one is trying to predict. Let me just repeat that because um, this explains the distinction between prediction and prophecy in a very clear way. David said, The time beyond which scientific prediction has no access is different for different phenomena. For each phenomena, it is the moment which at the creation of new knowledge may begin to make a significant difference to what one is trying to predict. In other words, a prophecy is a guess about the future where new knowledge creation is going to have an effect on that phenomena. But a prediction, I usually like to say, it's a derivation from a scientific theory, a logical derivation from a scientific theory, which is true, but it's not the full story. Because from a good scientific theory, I can make the prediction, and this is the example that David has used, and I've used, I can make the scientific prediction from good astrophysical principles, laws, laws of physics. Every astronomer has done this. Every astronomer who's ever had a podium somewhere has talked about this. That in approximately 5 billion years, something like that, the sun will expand into a red giant and will engulf the earth, or at least extinguish life on the earth by boiling the ocean, something like that. That's a prediction, apparently. But not really. Not according to this. Because we don't know what humans of the very distant future will do. They might save the earth, if only to preserve it like a museum piece, as I think David has said in various places. So that's not a real prediction. It's a prophecy about what people will do or what it will be possible to do. Now, on the other hand, if I make a prediction that tomorrow the sun will continue to shine, given the laws of physics today, that's a prediction because... There is no sign whatsoever that knowledge is going to be created in the next 24 hours that is going to allow us to affect the sun in some way. So there's your distinction. Back to the book. David writes, Since our estimates of that too are subject to the same kind of horizon, we should really understand all our predictions as implicitly including the proviso unless the creation of new knowledge intervenes. Yes, so I like that. So it's got that proviso. There's a lot of provisos here when we speak using Popperian style language, using the language of the beginning of infinity. You know, um, when I say I know something, uh, it comes with the proviso that provisionally things could change. I could be wrong about this. It doesn't mean I'm certainly absolutely confident that it must remain the same forever, that it's inerrant. Okay, There are all these kinds of provisos. Uh, I, 
I expect things will continue to get better because I expect that people will continue to produce knowledge and solve problems. With the proviso that we don't end up falling into an ideological hole where people decide that it's better for us to stop creating any kind of pollution and to ensure that the state has complete control over the means of production and that kind of thing. Okay, so with those provisos, with the proviso that we continue to exploit resources and use the best of our enlightenment traditions and ideas in order to fuel knowledge creation. Back to the book, David writes, Some explanations do have reach into the distant future, far beyond the horizons that make most other things unpredictable. One of them is that fact itself. Another is the infinite potential of explanatory knowledge, the subject of this book. Okay, so just pausing there. So some things do reach off into the infinite future. Namely, how knowledge is constructed. <laughs> the infinite potential of explanatory knowledge. The fact that explanatory knowledge will, will enable the transformation of physical reality around us because of what we choose to do. That will always be the case. Nothing about explanatory knowledge can change that unless, you know, including the fact that we could choose to do ridiculous things that cause us to go extinct in the way of the dinosaur. The potential was always still there. The potential for explanatory knowledge to radically transform the universe, the cosmos. Let's keep going. David writes, To attempt to predict anything beyond the relevant horizon is futile. It is prophecy, but wondering what is beyond it is not. When wondering leads to conjecture, that constitutes speculation, which is not irrational either. In fact, it is vital. Every one of those deeply unforeseeable new ideas that make the future unpredictable will begin as a speculation. And every speculation begins as a problem. Problems, in regard to the future, can reach beyond the horizon of prediction too. And problems have solutions. In regard to understanding the physical world, we are in much the same position as Erostathenes was in regard to the Earth. He could measure it remarkably accurately and he knew a great deal about certain aspects of it, immensely more than his ancestors had known only a few centuries before. He must have known about such things as seasons in regions of the Earth about which he had no evidence. But he also knew that most of what was out there was far beyond his theoretical knowledge as well as his physical reach. We cannot yet measure the universe as accurately as Aristotelians measured the Earth, and we too know how ignorant we are. For instance, we know from universality that artificial intelligence is attainable by writing computer programs, but we have no idea how to write or evolve the right one. We do not know what qualia are or how creativity works, despite having working examples of qualia and creativity inside all of us. We learned the genetic code decades ago, but we have no idea why it has the reach it has. We know that both of the deepest prevailing theories in physics must be false. We know that people are of fundamental significance, but we do not know whether we are among those people. We may fail or give up, and intelligences originating elsewhere in the universe may be the beginning of infinity. And so on for all the problems I have mentioned, and many more. Wheeler once imagined writing out all the equations that might be the ultimate laws of physics on sheets of paper all over the floor. Quote from Wheeler. Stand up, look back on all those equations, some perhaps more hopeful than others. Raise one's finger commandingly and give the order, fly. Not one of those equations will put on wings, take off or fly. Yet the universe flies. End quote from Meisner. Thorne and Wheeler in their book Gravitation, 1973. We do not know why it flies. What is the difference between laws that are instantiated in physical reality and those that are not? Pause there my reflection. So this idea of flies, well, it presumes, I think, to some extent that laws can exist independently of a physical reality. I don't know what that would mean that you could have physical laws, alternative physical laws, out there in abstract space. Now, if they do exist out there in abstract space, they, you know, in a sense, one might argue that they would give rise to an alternate physical reality, which we don't have access to. I don't know. But certainly it might be a mystery as to why this set of physical laws exists at all in the first place, governing this particular universe. So maybe there are physical laws instantiated in physical reality, namely these ones here. 
and no others. But we don't know the answer to that yet. Either way, it's a mystery. If all possible physical laws are instantiated out there in the universe somewhere, why? If they're not, why? (laughs) Interesting question. Here are some more questions. David goes on to say, quote, What is the difference between a computer simulation of a person, which must be a person because of universality, and a recording of that simulation, which cannot be a person? End quote. So we've got the possibility of a person, which is what we are. If we took the program that's running on our brains and stuck it into a computer, then that would be a person as well because it would be thinking, it would be processing information. That's what we're doing. It would be constructing knowledge because it would have the relevant program, the program which constructs knowledge in a computer. I'm doing this action because I'm pointing at my own laptop. (laughs) Presumably, you could stick it into a laptop. I I would also say there's a moral hazard here because who knows what the quality would be. It could be terrible suffering. So don't do it yet until we know. (laughs) We're nowhere near that anyway, by the way. But, but, But if you could, if you could simulate a person, but then you recorded that and you played the recording, is the recording not a person? Presumably not. So what's going on? This is the distinction between whether or not something has a subjective content, qualia, consciousness, and something that does not. David goes on to ask, quote, When there are two identical simulations underway, are there two sets of qualia or one? Double the moral value or not? Our world, which is so much larger, more unified, more intricate, and more beautiful than that of Aristothenes, and which we understand and control to an extent that would have seemed godlike to him, is nevertheless just as mysterious, yet open to us now as it was to him then. We have lit only a few candles here and there. We can cower in their parochial light until something beyond our ken snuffs us out, or we can resist. We already see that we do not live in a senseless world. The laws of physics make sense. The world is explicable. There are higher levels of emergence and higher levels of explanation. Profound abstractions in mathematics, morality, and aesthetics are accessible to us. Ideas of tremendous reach are possible. But there is also plenty in the world that does not and will not make sense until we ourselves work out how to rectify it. Death does not make sense. Stagnation does not make sense. A bubble of sense within an endless senselessness does not make sense. Whether the world ultimately makes sense will depend on how people, the likes of us, choose to think and act. Pausing there, my reflection. So as I've said many times before, this is a great rebuttal, response, refutation against other public intellectuals of our time. Prominent among them, Richard Dawkins and Neil deGrasse Tyson, the biologist and the astronomer, coming at this from two different directions. Richard Dawkins says, we've evolved in middle world, so our brains have evolved such that we can only understand the things that are of approximately our size and our speed and so on. So it is no mystery why we can't understand the universe as a whole. It's too big. We didn't evolve for that. Or quantum theory. It's too small. We didn't evolve for that. He doesn't understand what universality is, the universality of the mind. We can model within our minds anything. It doesn't matter what the size of the thing is. That is a parochial misconception about what a human person's mind is. We're not like all those other creatures. And Neil deGrasse Tyson says, well, maybe the ultimate laws of physics are just so complicated we'll never come to understand them. Again, this is a misunderstanding. Computational universality might be falsified in some way, shape, or form. But until then, we've got nowhere else to leap to. The best understanding that we have is that our minds contain within them universal computers, or can emulate, certainly can emulate universal computers. Our brains are universal, our minds are universal. We can, therefore, simulate phenomena that exist out there to any degree of fidelity that we like. We just have to keep learning more and more and more. So he doesn't understand universality either. The universality of the laws of physics and the relationship between our minds and the structures that are out there, this concept of self-similarity that I've talked about before either. David Deutsch has this positive worldview that things make sense 
and that that's not going to end for the last time in terms of this book <laughs> i'm reading others right now of course so go to the physics of canon can't go to the fabric of reality you can hear me say this phrase again but for the last time with the beginning of infinity i'll say and david writes quote many people have an aversion to infinity of various kinds but there are some things that we do not have a choice about there is only one way of thinking that is capable of making progress or of surviving in the long run and that is the way of seeking good explanations through creativity and criticism what lies ahead of us is in any case infinity all we can choose is whether it is an infinity of ignorance or of knowledge wrong or right death or life we're only in chapter 1 and already there are these phenomenal advances in philosophy phenomenal advances in epistemology excellent explanations of what our best explanations of epistemology and philosophy are uh, all illustrated with some excellent science um so that'll do me for now that's um that's quite a bit of reading uh and maybe uh tomorrow I'll 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 try and get into chapter 2 we'll see how we go see you.